What's going on, everybody? Welcome to yet another episode of the Core Consults RX podcast. AJ, Cole, and myself, all three of us together again. Yes. We're making it happen. Trying to get in a schedule before AJ de- de- uh, departs to his his uh, fourth year rotations and we never see him again. So, <laughs> so we're trying to get him uh, while we got him. I've got to say, that was like an extremely smooth pre-record um, session. You mean before we actually yeah, just yeah. now? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. we just very little, very little. Uh, we just just started going. It's all business. Yeah, <laughs> it's good. Yeah, usually we waste about thirty to forty five <laughs> minutes discussing how we're even going to lay this out. Then we have some sort of technical difficulty. Yeah, that's true. But uh, anyways, so uh, AJ, everything going good on your end, buddy? Oh yeah, I'm back in black. Yeah, you, you got the scrubs on today. Um, how much longer do you got in school? Two months. That is crazy. The longest two months of my life. When did you When did you start with us? What year were you? Second year, right? That was first. I think he was, yeah, he was the first year. First year. year. Yeah, or like, at least when we started working together, you were just you were brand new. I think when we started working together, I don't even think you were had started your first year, right? Weren't you yeah, like coming in like August to school? Yeah, that's funny. Full so, circle. Yeah. Almost. We'll see. Yeah. It's yet to be determined. We'll see he's, how we'll see how rotations go. Twelve months to mess it up. <laughs> so uh, good. That's awesome. Um, so today is another accredited episode for continuing education, thanks to our friends over at FreeCE.com. And so, uh, if you are a unlimited member, um, or I believe it's gold member now is their their new um, categories uh, or higher, then you can get access to this at no additional charge. Um, after you listen to the episode, we will give you a secret code somewhere embedded in the episode. Um, secretly. In a, yeah, very secretly. And that way you guys have to listen to us and uh, or at least try to figure out where we have the code at. And uh, then from there, you go to the post-activity test um, on FreeCE's website and um, take the 10-question multiple choice test and then you get your one-hour continuing education credit for pharmacists and nurses. And um, so if you are not a FreeCE member, um, definitely check out their website. They have a lot of really good learning opportunities, um, live events. They have a whole bunch of different monographs. Uh, our podcast episodes are all on there now. That are, we have several accredited episodes, so uh, definitely check them out. And uh, big thanks to them for continuing to work with us. I'm trying to think of a way that we could, um, that somebody could get the password without listening. And I'm, I'm not sure there is a good way. You could probably run this through like a uh, transcript. Yes, thing you could run just through search. A trans- do, but but we're going to say the a word. transcriber AI and then Control F for password, mm. and then you'll find. Oh it. yeah yeah yeah. So because yeah, that's a good idea. Because it would be very long. It would be. Okay. The no. transcript or yeah, transcript or the the number of password potential. What what we should just do is say password like a lot. And, yeah, and then you know it'll, I, I'm not like a lie. needle in a haystack. If somebody's <laughs> that willing to go through that kind of effort for one hour of continuous, as opposed to just listening, maybe one, um, maybe sometime we'll not say password the whole episode and just yeah, say the code. The code. The oh, code. that's a good idea. <laughs> um, maybe. <laughs> Yeah, if you're if you're willing to put that much effort into it, I think you deserve the password. So oh, hopefully, and then what if the, what if you did all that and then couldn't pass it? <laughs> that would be <laughs> that would be the ultimate best. Then you had to listen to it anyway. You had to listen to it anyway. <laughs> Wasted four hours of your life <laughs> looking through a transcript. Fantastic. Anyway, uh, today's episode we are going to be discussing various f- types of anemia. Yeah, um, I, we've done some anemia stuff. Um, I think anemia. we did an anemia episode a long time ago, and then we've done some kind of sprinkled in and patient cases and whatnot. But uh, this is going to be kind of a rundown of some of the more common types of anemia yep cover yep. iron deficiency and ckd um anemia due to inflammation b12 folate deficiency yep aplastic yep. some other stuff okay. so um got a lot to of super exciting stuff to get through yeah and it actually is a lot so this will we'll try not to mess around too much because we have a lot to get through in the next hour so yeah. um prepare yourself <laughs> um but we will start kind of more broadly about what anemia is and we're going to define some terms that i'm sure you're familiar with but we want to be thorough um so red blood cells right the job of red blood cells bring oxygen from the lungs to the tissue and carbon dioxide from the tissue to the lungs the less red blood cells you have the less oxygen that's being transported and the patient's um, or individual's gas exchange process is impaired due to the increased levels of carbon dioxide. Um, and when you discover an anemia in a patient, that's going to prompt you to investigate what the cause is. So um, as we as Mike laid out and as we'll go through, there are multiple causes of anemia. Yeah. And sometimes there's, there's uh, multiple causes happening all at once, which is 
throws even more of a confusing wrench into the mix. Um, but as far as the the process of a red blood cell and erythrocyte kind of um, maturing, it, it starts off as a, a pluripotent stem cell, and then um, with the help of erythropoietin and um, it's the uh, a couple other um, growth factors and whatnot, it's able to uh, eventually become a peripheral reticulocyte, which is like an immature red blood cell, and then eventually is um, is is kind of evolved into a, a mature erythrocyte or red blood cell, which is then put into circulation. Uh, it has a lifespan of around 120 days for a typical healthy blue red blood cell. And the blood cell itself um, is about 90% of it, uh, the protein content, is um, consists of hemoglobin, um, which is the oxygen-carrying molecule, as Cole was describing. And so the hemoglobin is a very important part of it. And... Um, you know, as far as the erythropoietin's kind of role, um, there's various things that can kind of lead to a patient um, sort of having a signal for erythropoietin to be to be released, um, which is it's released from the the kidneys, um, and uh, is usually in regards to some kind of oxygen deprivation, um, but it's released and, and that signals um, the production and, and process of maturation of, of red blood cells um, so from the erythroid myro. Um, also, folate, um, B12, iron um, play a role as well. Um, and then uh, eventually, um, you know, kind of this goes full circle once you uh, allow the, the red blood cells to carry oxygen. Once the oxygen, demand, you know, starts to go down again, um, it starts the process over, and EPO is kind of that other signaling factor that kind of is in balance with the hemoglobin levels. Right. Um, Speaking of hemoglobin. Yeah. Because um, obviously this is an important marker. Uh, hemoglobin consists of two alpha chains and two beta chains that are linked by a heme group. Heme uh, is a porphyrin ring with an iron atom at its center. A heme group with an iron at its center is capable of binding oxygen. So the process of heme synthesis requires the presence of vitamin B6 to act as the reaction catalyst. Um, and then hemolytic destruction of red blood cells, if that's greater than the marrow production capacity, then we have an anemia, right? So the hemoglobin value decreases to a steady state level at which production is equal to destruction, if that makes sense. So it's going to lower it, yeah, the... It, in a, in a healthy patient, there's that nice steady state, you know, that's achieved. But yeah, once you get too much of those red blood cell destructions, unfortunately, uh, anemia is going to gonna show up. And uh, that's where we hopefully, depending on what's causing it in the first place, but that's where we're going to end up having to correct. Um, so basically anemia is traditionally defined as hemoglobin levels being less than 13 uh, in men and less than 12 in female patients uh, who are not pregnant. Um, and either, there's multiple kind of signs and symptoms when it comes to, uh, you know, the chronic presentation of anemia. Now, these may, these may differ a little bit if it's a more acute um, situation or there's a, a, a bleed or something like that. But um, chronic anemia that's, you know, happening over time, um, that lack of oxygen um, availability, you know, and the lack of the red blood cells ability to carry oxygen um, kind of, you know, it makes sense of why the patients would have certain types of signs and symptoms that are associated with it. So fatigue is a big one. Um, you know, patients having tachycardia or um, tachypnea, um, angina, because the oxygen deprivation and obviously those myocardial sites um, they have more oxygen demand they're able to get. So you start getting um, like a like a an anaerobic, I guess, uh, respiration type situation where they're they're no longer able to um, to, to carry that oxygen or, or utilize that oxygen because it's not getting to them in the first place. Mm -hmm. Shortness of breath, palpitations. Um, Cole had mentioned vitamin B six. Um, also, B twelve um, is another big one. Um, when that is, there's a deficiency there, you start having neurological symptoms, um, sp specifically associated with anemia due to B twelve deficiency. That's very common. Um, B six can if there's a deficiency there from you know, medication related issues or things that can also lead to some neurologic symptoms. And then uh, it can also affect cognitive function as well, um, mental acuity. Uh, it can also be uh, sort of reduced when patients are anemic. Right. So it depends on the patient. Um, and younger, healthier patients you may end up not having very, you know, very noticeable symptoms because their bodies kind of can can sort of rebalance and get used to those lower hemoglobin levels. Mm -hmm. But older patients, more frail patients, that's the, the effects of the anemia can be really, you know, uh, detrimental to someone's quality of life. Right. 
and if if they are healthy and aren't noticing, it can get to a pretty significant exactly. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, they can get into, it can get pretty severe before it's even noticed because of symptoms if it's not incidentally recognized. Uh, so we want to talk a little bit about um, lab values. So um, specifically the ones that you would get in a complete blood count, a CBC. Um, so white blood cells, when you see white blood cells, it's referencing neutrophils, macrophages, basophils, lymphocytes, eosinophils. Um, and then the hemoglobin, the hemoglobin value is going to show a rough estimate of the oxygen carrying capacity. Um, hematocrit is the percent of actual volume of red blood cells and a unit volume of whole blood. And that's typically three times the hemoglobin. And then the mean uh, corpuscular volume, this one's important, especially when you're identifying the type of um, anemia, is the average size of the red blood cell. Also, platelets are going to be on here, um, as well as reticulocytes, which are immature red blood cells that circulate for about a day in the bloodstream before developing into mature red blood cells. All those are going to pop up on a CBC. And as Cole mentioned, the, the MCV is definitely an important kind of first step when you're looking at some of the potential causes of, of anemia. So, and, and it's, it may not be as helpful if there is multiple types of anemia present at the same time, but, you know, in, in a more simplistic case where there is, you know, one type of anemia, starting with the MCV, usually that kind of gives you at least an idea of where to go from there. So if the MCV is uh, high, so usually um, being above 100, um, that is most likely going to be um, something that is, um, associated with vitamin B12 deficiency um, or possibly a folate deficiency. Um, now, if if there's if the MCV is high and the B12 level um, is normal, the folate level is normal, then uh, you could you know need to consider some things like hep um, hepatic disease, um, hypothyroidism, and there's a couple other you know like drug induced anemias um, that can present that way. Um, but usually MCV being elevated, that tends for us to kind of lean towards B12 or folate deficiency. If the MCV is normal, um, usually in the range of 80 to 100, somewhere in there, some some reference ranges will have sit down to 75. But um, and if, the, if that's normal, um, checking the reticulocyte count, um, if that be is high, that is more so uh, associated with like acute blood loss, um, hemolysis type situation. Or if it's low, um, at that point, you'd want to check the white blood cells and platelets. Um, if those are low, then that may be in, in a plastic anemia or even a, a leukemia situation. If the white blood cells are normal or high or the platelets are normal or high, then it may be a, a due to chronic infection, chronic inflammation, um, even type of um, type form of malignancy or, or chronic renal disease. And then if the MCV, kind of going back to the beginning, is low, so usually below 80, some, like I said, some reference ranges say below 75. But um, that, at that point, we're thinking the microcytic anemia, and usually um, iron deficiency is a, you know, a very prevalent situation that will cause that. Um, so the next thing you check is the ferritin, which we'll end up talking about in more detail in just a minute. If that's low, then you know the iron deficiency anemia is most likely the cause. If that's elevated or normal, um, then we have to dig a little deeper. It could be anemia due to chronic um, disease, could be um, even something like lead intoxication, um, sideroblastic anemia, and there's a few other things that can, can result in that. But a lot of times, MCV being below 80, we're thinking iron deficiency anemia. So that's yep. a, kind of just a basic flow of the way, but it all kind of starts with that MCV level. Right. So it's an important one to evaluate. Yes. Do you want to start with iron deficiency anemia? Yeah. Okay. So you, you want to start? You want oh, to? sure. Yeah. Um, um, so iron deficiency anemia, we'll start with that. Um, iron is best absorbed in the ferrous form. So ferrous would be Fe2+, plus, uh, if you're looking at the des designation. The ferric form, Fe3+, plus, is not absorbed unless it's bound to protein um, until it is reduced to the ferrous form by stomach acid. Heme iron, which is the ferric form of heme, can be found in meat, fish, um, and that's easier to absorb. Once transported across the intestinal mucosal cells, it's converted back to the ferric form. So a little background on iron. Um, it can be stored in two different forms, hemosiderin and ferritin. So you're going to be more familiar with ferritin. It's the most readily available form present in both the plasma um, and the reticuloendothelial tissues. Uh, ferritin in the plasma stays in equilibrium with the ferritin stored in the tissues, and that's what they use to estimate the total body stores of ferritin. Um, generally, uh, ferritin of less than 12 to 15 predicts a deficiency. Often, they will go up to a less than 30 
now, and that's nanograms per milliliter. Um, and increases in serum ferritin likely indicate a systemic inflammation. And we'll talk a little bit about that, um, or infection, or possibly a liver disease. Yeah, that's that's always a weird situation. If like you see the MCV being low, and you're automatically kind of thinking iron deficiency anemia, but then you'll see sometimes instead of getting a full iron panel, they'll just get the ferritin level. Um, I, I saw one the other day where the MCV was a little low, but the ferritin was like uh, I, it was some it was the highest ferritin level I'd ever, I had ever seen, and the, it turns out it wasn't the anemia, um, or it wasn't the iron deficiency in, um, that was causing the anemia. It was Chronic uh, inflammation. Different reasons. So, yeah, ferritin is a big, definitely a big one to look at. Um, but uh, some others, when it comes to iron, you know, deficiency specifically, getting an iron panel is, is a good idea because you would want to look at the serum iron, um, which is, you know, the, the concentration of iron that's bound to transferrin. Um, transferrin is the that plasma protein that's responsible for transferring iron basically through the blood to the liver, spleen, bone marrow. Um, and then we also have uh, total iron binding capacity, TIBC, um, which measures the blood's capacity to bind iron with transferrin. And then you'll also see transferrin saturation, which is that serum iron over the, the total iron binding capacity, um, just multiply by 100 to get a percentage. And usually when we think of deficiency, uh, we're thinking of a, a TSAT of less than 20% um, is usually what would indicate iron deficiency anemia. Now, um, that may be a little bit more skewed. Uh, they, they have a little bit higher cutoff when you talk about chronic kidney disease, but we'll get to that in a little bit. Yeah. Um. As far as what it can be associated with, iron deficiency, anemia, um, alterations in the balance of intake um, of iron, loss of iron, absorption and demand. So common causes might be uh, pregnancy, um, chronic blood loss, dietary factors, endurance sports. Um, specifically with blood loss, it reduces the amount of iron that can be recycled from the red blood cells. And it kind of happens in stages. Um, in the initial stage, the iron source become depleted. Um, there's normal hemoglobin content because there's an adequate, there's adequate iron from the red blood cell turnover. Um, in the next stage, iron transport into the bone marrow is diminished. And then in the third stage, they've reached, um, IDA with depleted iron stores and diminished hemoglobin production. So that would be true iron deficiency anemia. Yeah. And I think that's an important one too, to remember, especially in like a primary care setting or something when Cole was talking about blood loss, whether that be from you know, something completely natural, a menstrual cycle or whatnot, or even there's cases where people develop iron deficiency anemia because of chronic um, epistaxis, as the, you know, nosebleeds. And uh, it, they're severe enough to where they're losing enough blood that it actually results in deficiency. So, um, or if a patient's got chronic NSAID use, things like that, maybe dig a little deeper to see if there's a potential that they could have some kind of a bleed going on. Because mm -hmm. that's definitely something that uh, you don't want to overlook. Yeah. Um, I had I had a patient one time who we were trying to get the meds right as far as side effects go, and it was we were dealing with um, um, I, I, I want to say it was it was a psych med of some kind, but we were trying to get or no, it was that in combination with blood pressure meds, and we were trying to balance some dizziness, and eventually um, th it wasn't making sense as far as the side effects she was having with the dizziness and whatnot. So we finally eventually said it was the weekend when I was, I was checking in on her, and she's um, basically telling me the symptoms are getting worse. And so we said to I was like, you, we, you need to go to the ED, and uh, since the clinic's closed and all that, and turns out that's it was actually a bleed from mm. like um, she hadn't told us about despite us asking about over-the-counter supplements, uh, turns out ibuprofen is something that you should tell people about and <laughs> was taking too much of it. So um, that we were thinking Stomach that the whole time, it, yeah, we were thinking the whole time it was just the med, the blood pressure meds making her dizzy and nope. Yeah. I had to get transfused. It's definitely something you don't want to miss and some and seemingly easy thing to miss too, yeah. especially if you don't get a good history. Well, and I feel like you know, a lot of times, especially, I mean, at least from my point of view, I'm thinking... I default to the medication thing, you know, side effect type things. I'm yeah. trying to mitigate that from a pharmacist standpoint. Yeah. And, you know, a bleed is something that's like, oh, how, could, how long could that be going on before, right. you know, somebody's, you know, actually not recognized. And it turns out it's, if it's a minor one, it can go on. Well, because the symptoms can be so nonspecific. Yeah. The signs can be clear, yeah. but if sometimes they're not there. So the symptoms can be nonspecific. And you're right. I, I do find myself, by, whenever somebody's like, I'm having the symptom, just completely biasing to the meds. Well, what med could cause right. that? Oh, there's no meds that cause it. Wow, well, um, you know, I, I'm out of luck. I'm, there's nothing else I can do. But there's, <laughs> there's could be there could be something going on completely unrelated to the medications and the the um, conditions you take. They are taking the medications for. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I need a whole medical team. You sure do. I sure do. So um, 
They have iron deficiency anemia. What are we going to do about it? First, we need to determine the severity. Uh, we also need to determine the cause so we can maybe stop that, like ibuprofen. <laughs> um, the goal, correct uh, and replenish the iron stores. Options we have, um, kind of over-the-counter dietary supplementation is common in less severe cases. Um, oral iron formulations, parenteral iron formulations, and then transfusions, in, like in her case, when it's more significant. Yeah, and ideally, when we're talking about replenishing iron stores, you know, we we want to, unless it's a really severe case right from the start, you know, a lot of times we can get by with supplemental iron. Now, I will say there's some patients that insist on trying, I'll just do dietary, you know, sources of iron and do it that way. If you're already deficient in iron, it's usually pretty difficult to get enough iron from your diet at that point to correct the anemia, plus build up your iron stores again and then right. get back to a normal. Maybe maintaining normal. adequate iron yeah. long-term diet, sure, but to correct it. Right. To, to, it's, a lot, it's a lot of meat. It's I mean, a, I like my meat. I like yeah, meat. Yeah, sure. It's, I like fish. You, you can get it from tofu as well, so maybe Don't like tofu. Okay. I was, you know, I'm trying to be inclusive. I'm good people with... People who don't eat meat coal, jeez. Good with oatmeal. See this, AJ? I do really like broccoli. Surprising, do you? surprising source of. Uh, I like broccoli iron, too. You know, you, you got steamed your potatoes. Remember when we did our uh, oh, your yeah. potato discussion? That one that long ago. Yeah. So there you go. That's a lot, that's a possibility. Cole loves that one. I do love. He potatoes. knows which one to eat. Do them in any so, any way you can. I yeah. Like potatoes. <laughs> um, also, some things that can actually decrease the absorption. boil or mash them. <laughs> stick them in a stew. <laughs> any way you do. <laughs> Put them in the air fryer. Yeah. That sounds gross. Um, there's some things that can decrease iron absorption. Um, caffeine, uh, milk, uh, tea um, are all things that can slightly decrease the absorption of iron from the diet. But um, like I said, getting it from the diet alone, usually if you're already deficient, is, is not going to be sufficient. So um, if we can get by with oral formulations, that's usually um, the ideal way of doing it because uh, the iron infusions definitely have uh, more side effects and things that can go wrong but there are so many different oral formulations of, of iron supplements mm -hmm. out there um, the three most common at least I would say you know from an over-the-counter availability standpoint would be ferrous sulfate uh, ferrous fumarate and then ferrous gluconate um, from a ferrous sulfate standpoint it's the 325 milligram tablet has 65 milligrams of elemental iron whereas the 325 milligrams of ferrous fumarate is 106 milligrams of elemental iron and then 325 milligrams of ferrous gluconate is 38 milligrams. So they are not created equal. Um, so I, I always tell like my PA students and whatnot, I tell them like, even if you, you know, are expecting them to get over the counter, still send the prescription in for whatever you're trying to prescribe, usually ferrous sulfate in a lot of cases, just because you want to ensure that the patient doesn't grab the wrong product by accident. Um, there's also a couple of prescription versions. Um, they have carbonyl iron. Um, they have polysaccharide iron complex, which is the, under the brand name New Iron. Um, and there, there's some others as well. But when it comes to the dosing, you know, we typically are looking for um, the we're looking at the, the dose of the elemental iron, not the the salt form. And so historically, um, they've kind of targeted 100 to 200 milligrams of elemental iron per day. Uh, for as long as three to six months to kind of replenish those stores and then, you know, maybe decreasing to maintain, you know, those levels from there. But um, the issue with that is the side effect profile. One, mm -hmm. taking any, you know, if you were to take ferrous sulfate, for example, to get 200 milligrams of elemental iron a day, you're talking three pills a day. Yeah. So good luck getting people to take anything three times a day or if you take three and they're uncomfortable enough anyway yeah you take ferrous sulfate by itself like three tablets all at once instead of separating them out you're talking about some rough stomach issues constipation I have, I have bad memories of when i was in like i don't know college or maybe in pharmacy school and i decided i needed to be healthy so i was just going to take a multivitamin Heck daily yeah. or whatever nice just because of course i had iron in it and i didn't eat breakfast ever and so i would just take it first thing in the morning and i would end up like dry heaving over the sink because of how i guess the gi discomfort that i would have yeah. from it or something if i didn't recognize that that's what it was but of course you know it only took a few days for me to be like i need to stop taking this stupid <laughs> multivitamin so much for being healthy it's almost like it's making me way worse <laughs> it just seems awful I, I like that you took the multivitamin and then skipped breakfast so it's like <laughs> you could just keep eating food and maybe i, I, a healthy I didn't breakfast. breakfast i do now just a smidge um but I, I didn't eat breakfast for, like, years. If that doesn't, like, define every, like, high school, college guy. I, yeah, I remember the same thing. I was like, oh, uh, this guy in the polo shirt at 
GNC gave me this supplement that's going to make me <laughs> shredded. It's just got a bunch of nonsense that ruins your kidneys. Right. <laughs> it doesn't do anything. Yeah. Um, so because of the stomach and GI issues with with um, iron supplements when taken orally, you know, the that whole, you know, one to three times a day iron dosing is rough. And a lot of patients can't tolerate it. Um, you know, we, we have some options like slow FE, which is a, you know, a lower, a lower dose that gets released a little bit slower. It's a little bit less uh, chances of, of stomach upset, but definitely still there. Um, however, l- somewhat recently, um, I guess relatively least recently, um, there's been some evidence that shows that, you know, maybe we don't need to actually dose iron as, as that frequently. Um, and in fact, there's been some that show that alternate uh, day dosing, so taking you know, iron every other day, um, basically gives you the exact equivalent response from a results standpoint, but then reduces that um, adverse effect profile. Um, there's been a few different studies now, and, and I will say that I feel like the group that has, has like really adopted this already and is been having a lot of success with it is the OBGYN, women's health, nurse practitioners. Mm-hmm. That, I, mean, I feel like they're they're on that with the iron. Um, and a lot of them that I've talked to are doing that every other day, or I've had some that actually dose it Monday, Wednesday, Friday only. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, they, they're getting good results for a lot of patients and um, taking care of a lot of those adverse effects. Yeah. So I, that, that's a, it's a very good strategy. There's good data to back it up. So dosing iron, especially starting them off on like one pill a day or two pills a day, please don't do that. Yeah. I think the take that's home old school. point is if it's not a severe iron deficiency anemia, it's kind of a slow correction back. You can't just shove yourself full of oral iron supplements and it, and it comes back up. There was a small study with um, only about 54 women who were given multiple daily doses of iron and there seemed to be some paradoxical decrease in iron absorption, so it didn't work better and may have had a negative effect. So yeah, it's kind of it's kind of weird too. Like the it's like you know more is less or whatever the expression is, but you get less absorption the more iron you get, which is counterintuitive to what we would typically think. Right. So so what's actually happening is less is more. There you go. Which That's the, the word expression. I was looking for. Yes. I was lexicomping while I was also trying to make that coherent <laughs> sentence. Uh, really, really backfired. Lexicomping. I like that it's a verb. It's now. It, it is, for sure. Present um, progressive. <laughs> but, um, there's also another oral form that, that was approved in 2019 called Acufer is the brand name, um, which is ferric uh, maltol. It, it's a non-salt oral formulation of, of ferric uh, iron. And one of their claims to fame is that its adverse effect profile tends to be a lot more favorable. Um, it, the, for constipation, for example, was 4% with ferric maltol versus, you know, ferrous sulfate being 10 up to 39% of patients. I would argue probably much higher than 39%. But um, the dosing is uh, 30 milligrams twice a day for 12 weeks. Um, however, the the price, uh, which is what I was lexicomping, um, is definitely something that I, I think would be cost prohibitive yeah. um, so each capsule cost um, the awp is ten dollars and 61 cents per capsule yeah i bet so, you're talking pennies on a um, over-the-counter yeah yeah for sure supplement so um and it has a number of adverse effects that you would expect still um stomach upset constipation dark and tarry stools vitamin c increases the absorption of um iron in general um typically it's taken on an empty stomach but as we know, that causes problems with your stomach. So, right, as Cole pointed out yes. from his from his self induced so data, could not have taken it on an empty stomach. So you're going to get decreased absorption, but at least you know you're not going to be driving heaving over the sink. Um, right. So I don't know. I don't even know what the best way to counsel on that would be. I'd say try it on an empty stomach if you can't tolerate it. Then just you're going to take a little food. That's usually I feel like that's what I tell patients. <clears throat> um, there are interactions. Um, it needs an acidic environment and acids, H2 blockers, and PPIs will decrease the absorption. Um, so the recommendation is to take it two hours before or four hours after antacids, two hours before or four to eight hours after um, certain antibiotics like fluoroquinolones, tetracyclines, septonir. Um, we're going to want to separate uh, levothyroxine from it by two to four hours levodopa by two hours and Parkinson's disease, kind of a random one, but it's in there. I mean, then also that um, influenza treatment, Zafluza, um, they aren't to be used together. Is that the one, one dose one? Yeah, I think it inhibits, I think the iron inhibits like a chelating agent. I think it inhibits the absorption of the Zafluza, not yeah. the other way around. So skip that for a day. Yeah. 
Or skip, skip, iron skip the yeah. iron, yeah. Don't skip your windows. <laughs> <laughs> Flusa, you're going to still have influence. Oh, I, I, I've got uh, this. I, I got to take this iron. I can't. I, can't, I'm just take, have can't take I guess I'll just have the flu. <laughs> yeah, don't do that. Um, all right. So if that is not enough to restore someone's iron levels, or if they're you know really severe right from the start, um, you know maybe patients who have CKD that also have iron deficiency anemia that you know are on hemodialysis or on erythropoietin stimulating agents something, and they're still not their iron levels are still low. Sometimes we have to you know jump in onto IV. Uh, iron therapy, or if they're, you know, have some kind of like inflammatory bowel disease or you know, celiac disease or something where they have a hard time absorbing the, the oral iron, um, we have to, to go that route. Um, there's uh, several different formulations of, of IV iron are available. Um, there's a uh, fewer moxitol, there's iron dextran complex, um, there is ferric uh, dairy solmaltose, sol um, sodium ferric gluconate, um, iron sucrose, uh, it's one of those things where there's a lot of different, um, you know, dosing regimens and things that are both label and off label. Um, the big thing to, to remember is that, um, especially with iron dextran, um, it can have a sort of an anaphylactic re reaction. Um, and so especially with that one in particular, you do a test dose, a small test dose to see if the person reacts, um, before giving the full on you know, infusion. Um, and then patients who have a history of multiple drug allergies, um, you know, maybe it would have a statistically higher chance of also having an issue with, with that. Um, so doing a test dose, but, um, you know, the, the other thing is to worry about is the, you know, infusion reactions that aren't necessarily anaphylactic, but, you know, have, uh, you know, can be uncomfortable. And um, some places will, uh, will take, you know, patients who have multiple drug allergies or um, asthma, um, some sort of inflammatory condition, and they'll kind of pre-treat with methylprednisolone. Um, some also will add in diphenhydramine. You know, if you look at like the up-to-date authors, uh, they they say that they don't use diphenhydramine; they just use the steroid. So that's going to be kind of clinician-specific. Um, there's uh, that the monoferric, um, which is the the ferric dera, um, maltose, uh, was approved in January 2020, uh, and it was the one that's been FDA approved for like uses uses a single dose. Um, however, others are, are oftentimes used. Um, they have dosing that's off label that you can get away with a single dose as well. Um, so that's that one's claim to fame, but um, you'll still see other formulations out there. Um, adverse effects are a little bit more profound with uh, IV formulations. So worrying about things like muscle aches, flushing, um, both hypo and hypertension, tachycardia, peripheral edema. And you know, so it's something where if the patient has other comorbidities, especially cardiovascular comorbidities, um, you just want to use some, some caution and definitely closely monitor them and their, their vitals. Right. Um, there's some others. Uh, they're all hard to pronounce. Ferric. They are so multi-sigarity. That's the one, I, that's the one uh, I went there. I okay. just did them out of order. Gotcha. Um, so there's also the chelating agent um, that can treat iron toxicity. Yeah. yeah I'm going over this, in right? Case you, yeah, no. In okay. case you go too too much of that iron infusion, in case you, you have to reverse much, it. You can reverse it with a chelating agent, and that is uh, branded as Desferol, Defiroxamine. Um, there's also when to consider blood transfusion. So we've kind of been vaguely referencing when it's severe, consider blood transfusion. Um, more specifically, you might consider it if the hemoglobin is less than 8 or the hematocrit is less than 30%. Um, one unit of packed red blood cells can raise hemoglobin by 1 gram per deciliter. Um, and you want to pre-medicate with Tylenol and um, Benadryl. Um, adverse effects being microcirculatory complications and iron overload. Yeah. In which, which case you need a key that engage in. Yeah. And, that's, and really the, the outcomes of blood transfusion, they are risky. So it's something that we want to avoid if we can, which is why it's kind of like last line if they've already, you know, they've, if they've tried oral and IV iron. But uh, hopefully the, you know, the iron supplementation will avoid them needing a transfusion. Right. So uh, to jump into the next topic, B12 folate deficiency anemia, our, our macro acidic anemias. Um, we'll kind of start things off with, with, uh, folate deficiency. So I'm sorry, with vitamin B12 deficiency, um, I <laughs> literally am reading B12 and said folate. <laughs> um, so B12, you know, is a water soluble vitamin we're all very familiar with. Um, I'm sure it's in most of the drinks that everyone has to stay awake during their work days. Um, it's also very prevalent in meat, fish, you know, poultry, um, dairy products, uh, fortified cereals, things like that. Um, the, the body stores, 
a, a lot of B12. Um, you can have a, you can get your numbers, believe it or not, very high. I've tried it. Um, and so you get your blood work back, and you're like, oh, it's over 2,000. I guess I got enough B12 for a while. Um, but uh, um, dietary cobalamin is kind of like what starts the process. And one of the things that you'll see for patients who are on acid suppressing agents and things like that is they tend to have more prevalence of B12 deficiency because the, some of the um, the acidity is needed to, to sort of release that cobalamin um, from or the, in the cobalt from the food that they're, you're getting from you know in, in your diet, and so if if you're suppressing the acid is more basic higher pH, you, then you're going to have less of that cobalamin that's able to be absorbed and ultimately can lead to B12 deficiencies. Um, there's some uh, or there's several medications that can also um, lead to a B12 deficiency. Um, some of the ones I think of like right away would be hydroxyurea, um, methotrexate, uh, azathioprine. Um, and then more commonly, you'll see uh, like metformin is notorious for causing B12 deficiency. Yep. Um, in fact, the ADA now recommends if someone who's on metformin should get a B12, uh, their B12 tested once a year um, because of that whole uh, neuropathy, you know, manifestation of, of symptoms. Um, and someone who's on PPIs are also at risk. So I, it's usually those two together that I, when I see that, that's when I start asking about, you know, if there's ever been any signs of nerve pain. Um, some laboratory findings, um, like I said earlier in the episode, the, the MCV is usually high, is in the, above 100. Um, you'll see low hemoglobin, hematocrit, obviously, because it's anemia. Um, low reticulocyte count. And then the serum vitamin B12 is usually low. However, it may not show, you may start having some manifestations before the serum level actually is showing up um, as being low. And so there's um, a couple of things you can look at. There's homocysteine and methamyloic acid, um, which are usually elevated um, in B12 deficiency. And those are actually some of the first levels that start to change. And so if a patient has um, elevated uh, methamyloic acid levels, that one is specific to vitamin B12. So it's involved directly with the, the synthesis of it and or processing of B12. And so if it's a folate deficiency um, or that you're, or you're trying to decide whether, you know, it could be folate, it could be B12 if they're both in the normal range, but on the lower side, um, if that MMA level is high, then that may be uh, more indicative of B12 than folate. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, goals. Um, yeah. The goals would be to identify and correct the underlying cause. Um, reversible reversal of hematologic manifestations replace the b12 stores and prevent or stop the neurologic symptoms so um, this is a common workup if um, you have an elderly individual who's being worked up for memory disorders b12 is going to be included there um, early treatment is important because if it's extremely low and it goes on um, neurologic damage can be irreversible so um, even within a number of months, um, there can be some irreversible damage. So it's important to correct it quickly. Those with borderline low B12 levels, but no hematologic abnormalities um, should be followed at yearly intervals. No uh, treatment is necessarily warranted, though not harmful to take a supplement if you want. To. Yeah. It cures everything. <laughs> gives you, just right. gives you energy. So much energy. Just take a B12 supplement. Yeah, just take a ton of You can take one to 12. <laughs> <laughs> that's just, I'm just kidding. Don't, don't tell anybody that. effectively what injecting it is. Right? Yeah, that's true. That's what we're about to talk about. So the, the treatment options, um, cyanocobalamin is the most common form of B12 that we supplement with. And uh, there's a whole bunch of different potential dosing regimens. So just to give you like an example, oftentimes we do use the, uh, the IM um, B12 or cyanocobalamin balmonds it could be im or sub q and uh you know we, we may do like a, a thousand micrograms a day for a week um just to kind of like saturate the b12 stores and then you know once a week for four weeks and then we could even go monthly um th that's just one example there's a whole bunch of different potential ways of doing it um b12 is one of those that is water soluble like i said earlier so it's not something i'm really worried about causing issues with the kidneys or anything um there's a little bit of chance of like pulmonary edema and obviously irritation at the injection site so things like that to be aware of but for the most part it's pretty mild as you know as far as side effects go um there are oral options available However, especially if it's an issue where you're not able to absorb B12 um, or like in the case of metformin, it's, bas it's basically um, depleting your intrinsic factor, which is what's responsible for absorbing that um, you know, cabalamin into the system or in the, uh, in, from, from the diet. If that's not available, then giving an oral supplement is obviously not going to do much good to, to 
replenish those stores. So make sure if you do use an oral form that it's not taking oral like where you're swallowing it into the GI system, you're actually taking it sublingually. Um, sublingual tablets, um, you know, they are ideal uh, usually for B12. Um, lozenges are also available so you can absorb it buccally. Uh, but the big thing is, you know, if they are deficient, especially for metformin or some kind of like um, issue with absorption, try, I'm trying to get patients to do the, either the sublingual or the injections. There's also, if you want to get real fancy, there's a nasal, uh, uh, nascobol, which is the nasal solution of uh, B12. And you can do 500 micrograms in, in one nostril once weekly. And uh, I'm sure that feels really good. I don't know. I, I had, you know, I had the um, the nasal flu mist when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. And to me, that was just way worse than an injection. I'd probably just rather get this thing injected. Yeah, I've, I've done it. Did you ever do the uh, flu mist? Yeah, I did. Or you mean administer? Yeah. Not administer, but I had it given to me. It when, was just very uncomfortable. When I first got out of school, that was like a, a thing that we had to like learn how to do and stuff. And I was helping to teach like the immunization stuff to the new, which I was a new pharmacist too. I don't know why they let me do that, <laughs> but um, I was like going through it. I was like had all these like demo kits and stuff, and then like literally like a month later, they point. they were like, "Ah, this is garbage." Yeah. And so I just had like boxes of <laughs> flu mist samples to like I throw think away. When I graduated was the year that it wasn't even available. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. We should get it. We should bring it back. It's, well, it's, a resurgence. It's back. It's but back, right? I, I, I haven't seen a single person get it in no. you. And I, I swear it is, I'm telling you, it is uncomfortable. I'm like sure. I, I, It's like Flonase times 10. Like if you've ever had an uncomfortable interaction with Flonase, just where it kind of went you know, down the back and you're kind of like, uh, you know, for yeah. a few hours. Like it was like that for like two days. Oh, awesome. I didn't like it at all. Yeah. Just get a shot. Just get a shot. Don't be a baby. <laughs> don't, don't be. <laughs> don't don't be, a, be a baby. Even my eighth month old doesn't. Well, my cry. babies get plenty of shots. Yeah, so my baby gets plenty of shots. I say he doesn't. Uh, he, he did. He handled it like a champ. His last one, he got the, his second flu shot. And he just like looked at me like, "Am I supposed to be crying right yeah. now?" It's like one moment of kind of like, like, "What was yeah, that? What then the heck was that?" Totally forgot about <laughs> it. Like nothing. That's, don't worry about that. Anything else for B twelve? Nah, let's jump to folate. Jump to folate. So folic acid is a water soluble vitamin. Folate. Uh, but it is vitamin B9. It's a B vitamin. Um, it's necessary for the production of DNA and RNA. We're unable to synthesize sufficient folate to meet total daily requirements. Um, and so we depend on it from the diet. So we don't have enough endogenous folate. We have to get it exogenously. Um, often women of childbearing age, especially if they are intending to become pregnant, will be taking a folate supplement um, because um, a lack of folate can cause neural tube defects. So they take this to prevent that. In um, in the diet, you can get folate from fresh leafy greens, vegetables, citrus fruits, yeasts, mushrooms, uh, also dairy products as well. Yeah, all rich in folate. Very rich in folate. So treatment usually going to be folate tablets um, or folic acid tablets. Uh, over the counter, you're looking at strengths of usually 0.4 milligrams. Um, the one milligram strength is is prescription. Uh, there there is an injection, but I, I don't know that it's you, I've never seen it used. I don't know. I don't think it's something that's given very often. Um, and uh, adverse effects from old, from oral folate, you know, flushing, um, bronchial spasm if you're taking too high of a dose, uh, but usually pretty mild as well. Um, and it can decrease the serum concentrations of uh, patients who are taking phenytoin or phenobarb as well. Yep. So that's vitamin B12 and folate. Let's hop into anemia of chronic disease. Or chronic kidney disease. Sorry, anemia of chronic kidney disease, because anemia of chronic disease is going to be something very different. So chronic kidney disease. Um, or is it? I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, just trying to add some suspense. Let's make you wonder. Um, speaking of suspense, did you want to give the um, the password? Oh, yeah, which is blood. Blood. <laughs> B-L-O-O-D. All, all capital letters that will let you write in. Yes. Hopefully. B-L-O-O-D. All caps. Password. If you're control effing. Um <laughs> Okay, anemia of chronic disease. No, kidney disease. Dang it. <laughs> Cole's learning how to read. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> anemia of chronic kidney disease. Uh, it significantly increases um, as the kidney disease progresses. Uh, greater than 20% of patients with stage 3B uh, chronic kidney disease and greater than 50% with stage 4 um, chronic kidney disease. Uh, it's going to significantly increase the risk. We'll develop anemia. We'll develop yeah. anemia. Um, the definitions vary for men and women. Um, so similar yeah. hemoglobin levels, less than 12 in women, less than 13 in men, like we referenced before. Um, increased risk of heart failure and left ventricular hypertrophy, hospitalizations and blood transfusions, um, as well as mortality. 
Yeah. And a lot of times iron deficiency anemia is also present in these patients. And the Cadago guidelines actually give um, higher kind of cut points for where you would want to supplement with iron. So like with ferritin level, when it starts falling below um, 500 instead of all the way down to 30, um, as I previously mentioned with just straight up iron deficiency anemia in an otherwise healthy patient, um, you know, we have higher cut points because some of the, um, the issues can kind of manifest itself earlier um, than in CKD patients, especially with more advanced renal disease. But uh, the TSAT, instead of being less than 20, would be less than 30 um, in those patients. Um, and if, if they are found to be iron deficient, then we'll just supplement with iron, just like we would with a patient who doesn't have kidney disease. Mm-hmm. But really, because the, the renal function is limited, um, the their ability to produce erythropoietin is also limited, which is mm-hmm. usually what's kind of driving the, the kidney disease. And so in that case, we would want to supplement, or I guess I guess supplement's the right word here, um, even though it's a little bit more hardcore than a, a typical supplement, yeah. um, but erythropoietin-stimulating agents. Um, so like um, epotin alpha or um, darbopoietin. Um, if a patient has uh, a hemoglobin level less than 10 um, for most patients, Sometimes they'll let it go a little bit lower, like less than nine um, in hemodialysis, but um, you, less than 10 in non-hemodialysis. And uh, you're looking at giving these to, to kind of um, bring those levels up a little bit. Usually the target level for a hemoglobin um, in a patient with CKD, especially if they're on ESAs, would be 10 to 11. Some push it up to 11.5, um, but really 11 is where you start. Um, when you go higher than 11, you start worrying about the, the risk of complications. Um, yeah. Some patients can safely do up to 11.5, so there's a little bit of discrepancy there, but uh, we definitely are not normalizing hemoglobin levels back to like, you know, baseline. Right. Um, there's multiple studies that have looked at what the proper target would be. Um, there's one in particular called the CHOIR trial um, that had one group, um, hemoglobin level was targeted at 11.5, the other was 11.3, or excuse me, 13.5, and the other was 11.3. Um, the primary outcome was a composite of death, MI, hospitalization for heart failure, and stroke. And um, the higher hemoglobin level, uh, which was more of a normalized level, um, did show an increase in those that primary composite so definitely something that uh, you have to be aware of and um, use with caution and if and the patient does have goes above 11 or 11.5 or if you've established as a cutoff then back off on the dose let it come back down and keep that it's a balancing act right the fda has warnings out about this mm-hmm. similar thing death mi stroke for hemoglobin greater than 11 if that happens they recommend dose reducing by 25 yeah. percent um, and then they have similar box warnings and using the lowest effective dose um, to reduce the need for blood transfusions. Packed red blood cells, um, option if they're failing these other therapies um, or they're having acute symptomatic anemia. Yeah. Some some warnings besides what we were mentioning with the um, erythropoietin stimulating agents. Um, the, the big one I always think about is the, the risk of hypertension. Um, so patients who have like uncontrolled uh, hypertension kind of at baseline that c- could put them at higher risk by using these agents. Um, and there's others as well. Um, but it's, it's even uh, uh, epoetin is something that can even um, re- like lower seizure threshold. Um, Darbopoietin can as well. And so it's there's definitely, these are not to be taken like lightly, but also, you know, they can be very, uh, very useful in, in, in improving patients' quality of life. There is actually a new medication out uh, this month, February 2023, 20, which... This month when we're recording. Yeah. I mean, you which, guys will be in March here. Yeah, it'll, listen to it'll this. be the beginning so of March. It'll be a long time ago for y'all. <laughs> just a long time. <laughs> um, but a relatively new medication, um, branded as uh, Jezdevroc. Um, generic is Debrodestat. Um, but this is for patients who have been on um, dialysis, who are on he- dialysis and have been for at least four months. This is a hypoxia-inducible factor prolyl hydroxylase inhibitor. It's a mouthful. Yeah. Um, Who came up with that name for that class? It has um, similar um, box warnings to the epoetin um, uh, supplements. Increased risk of death, MI, stroke, um, thrombosis, um, tumor progression, interestingly, um, or recurrence. So it has box warnings for all those things, um, uh, VTE. It has adverse effects of hypertension. 24% of patients um, um, had hypertension, abdominal pain, um, and it's used to reduce the, ri- reduce the risk for blood transfusions. It hasn't been shown to improve quality of life, um, fatigue, or necessarily patient um, well-being. 
but it is started. Um, this is an oral med, and mm-hmm. it's started um, if they have a hemoglobin less than nine at four milligrams once a day, nine to ten, two milligrams, and if it's greater than ten, <coughs> one milligram once per day. And that's how you determine the dose is the pretreatment hemoglobin. Yeah, and and there are uh, like conversions if someone's already on. Um, uh, in the ESA, and you can kind of use that dose that they've been on currently to to, to switch them if you need to or, or whatnot. So LexiComp has a nice little breakdown of all that. So now, I was gonna, I was just gonna <laughs> say, you want to do the honors? Now it's anemia of chronic disease. Yeah, not kidney disease. Yeah, so he's been waiting minutes for this. I was jumping the gun, but really, I was just trying to get you to, to skip the whole kidney section. You just weren't going for it. Oh, but that's because yeah. I knew we had a new drug. I was <laughs> like, I was gonna drop that bombshell on everybody. Yeah, I'm just joking. <laughs> So anemia due to chronic disease, um, you know, the, the other term you'll sometimes hear is um, anemia um, due to inflammation, which kind of lumps in anemia of chronic disease and, and uh, anemia due to cr- uh, critical illness kind of in the same, um, under the same umbrella. Um, but uh, really the, the main kind of way that we're treating anemia that's due to, to chronic disease specifically or inflammation is by treating the underlying condition if we can. Uh, there's lots of different things that can kind of uh, lead to this, you know, patients that have chronic infections, um, HIV, uh, chronic lung infections. Um, you, you see this sometimes with like um, inflammatory bowel disease, rheumatoid arthritis, gout, um, different types of malignancies. Uh, there's, there's lots of things that can, that can cause it. Um, the one thing that I would say that, you know, a lot of it looks pretty similar from a lab standpoint when it comes to compare, comparing it to iron deficiency anemia. So, for example, iron levels are usually low um, in both situations. Um, transferrin levels, usually when it's inflammation, are either normal or low, but they will be higher in iron deficiency anemia because there's more available. Um, but transferrin saturation would both would be low in both situations. Mm-hmm. Ferritin is the big one, like what I mentioned earlier. Ferritin being uh, it is a kind of a precursor for some inflammatory mediators and things, or at least um, responsible for a response by elevation uh, when there's those inflammatory you know cytokines uh, in the system. And so, if someone has a really high ferritin level, um, even though their iron might be low, that's probably more indicative of of anemia due to inflammation versus iron deficiency anemia, because right. usually that that ferritin level would be low if right. it's iron. Um, and like Mike said, the preferred treatment is treating the underlying disorder and trying to identify um, if there are other causes of anemia. Iron supplementation is really reserved for patients with um, a concomitant iron deficiency anemia. And then they don't use urethroproteins stimulating agents um, in these situations. Yeah. Um, get that. Get the inflammation under control. They um, Transfusions would be strongly considered for um, severe anemia with complications involving bleeding. Um, Literal use of transfusions for correction of anemia and critical illness seems to have a negative effect on patient outcomes, so they want you to be conservative with when you're using the transfusions. Um, At hemoglobin 7 to 8, or maybe slightly higher if the patient is um, symptomatic, and some strategies to be restrictive with it are to give less blood, transfuse at a lower hemoglobin level, and aim for a lower target hemoglobin um, to hopefully improve outcomes. Yeah. So last but not least, uh, at least that we're going to talk about anyway, <laughs> you know, there's still lots of things we could, we could spend more time on, but uh, for time's sake, because we only got an hour, which is nothing. Nothing. I wish we had 17 hours. <laughs> we could do it for 17 hours. Oh my gosh. Could you imagine? We don't tell AJ. He just shows up and we have 17 hours to record. It would be That'd like be one awesome. of those um, telethons for raising money for charity. Right. Just like, oh, how except long? it would just be us talking. Just be us talking. And, and nobody, no money being nobody paid. Nobody be sending us any money. No, 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 the phone doesn't ring once. <laughs> That, that's a good idea. We should do that. Just yeah. see if anybody feels bad for us. Yeah. Um, aplastic anemia, we'll finish up with. <laughs> so uh, aplastic anemia um, can be due to autoimmune mechanisms. Um, it can be from you know direct injury to hematopoietic stem cells, whether it be from uh, medication, chemicals, you know, something along those lines, viral infections, genetic disorders. Um, but there's lots of different things that can lead to aplastic anemia. Um, patients will oftentimes, besides the you know, anemia and the typical symptoms associated with that, um, they'll oftentimes have thrombocytopenia and neutropenia as well. And, um, uh, you know, like I said, there's lots of different things. And even pregnancy in some cases can, can cause uh, uh, aplastic anemia to, 
show itself. Um, so just making sure you're kind of hopefully finding out the the reason for it if you can. Um, but uh, the medication wise is kind of limited um, as far as treatments. You want to go through first line options? Yeah. Um, sorry, I was totally distracted. You want to go through first line? Yeah, options? yeah, I got. You. I don't know where my. Uh, I was <laughs> thinking about brushing my kids' teeth. That's truthfully what I was thinking about. And I, I got extremely <laughs> distracted. <laughs> I'm, I have so many questions about that, and I don't know why that's what you're thinking about. But you know what? I like the I like the honesty. I respect that. Well, the honesty is that my wife asked me if I brushed his teeth this morning. That's and hilarious. I said yes, and I really did, and I was feeling guilty about it. Ah, uh, I'm gonna call her and tell her, dude. I know. Yeah, man, it's okay. That's good. I, I, I get that though. You're like, well, it's a white lie, and I don't have to get beat when I get. Home. I did like stick the toothbrush in his mouth, but yeah. he was kind of fussy about it, and we were late for daycare, so I was like, screw yeah, you it, know we're not brushing the teeth. Yeah, his teeth aren't going anywhere. <laughs> that's what dentists are for, dude. That is what um, dentists are for. Oh, that's funny. You're gonna get in trouble later. I know. That's hilarious. She doesn't listen. It's okay. <laughs> I'm how she does I tell her on <laughs> Facebook or something. All right. So uh, first line therapy um, is usually the assessing whether or not we're gonna go the hematopoietic stem cell transplant side or immunosuppressive therapy. Um, the age is usually kind of the first thing we're looking at to see whether or not you know we're gonna go a certain route or the other. Um, depending on which guideline you're looking at, like some, a lot of times we say less than 50, um, hematopoietic cell transplant is where, you know, is long, assuming that there's, you know, something they can tolerate, um, there's an appropriate donor available, all that good stuff. Um, then we would go that route. Some, uh, some sources, including like the up-to-date authors that write their section on aplastic anemia, they actually use 40 as the age mm. cutoff. And then in parentheses, they say some experts use 50. So, mm. I like that. And I saw it. I was like, yeah, I, I usually say 50, so I'm like an expert, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's what that means. That's what that means. <laughs> um, but the, you know, if, if, if they are going to go hematopoietic stem cell transplant, great. Um, they usually get anti-thymocyte globulin and cyclophosphamide for kind of conditioning, uh, which has kind of helped to um, improve overall survival after the transplant. Um, and you know the but the the transplant is usually saved like I said for those younger patients who can tolerate it if they are over the age of fifty um, or according to some sources over the forty um, that immunosuppressive therapy is where we would kind of have to start with yeah um, so it's immunosuppressive therapy is used first line for patients older than fifty um, second line for um, younger patients um, and you talked about the antithymocyte globulin yeah and that's that's like an like kind of an add-on if you're doing the um, the hematopoietic stem cell to kind of condition you know the patient or whatever but the that's sort of the backbone of therapy with immunosuppressive therapy right um, we also have a drug branded as Promacta the generic is l trombopag works as a, a thrombopoietin non-peptide agonist and activates the um, uh, TPO receptor um, increasing platelet counts, it activates intracellular signal transduction pathways to increase proliferation, differentiation um, of the marrow cells. Um, it's added to standard um, therapy based on the results of the um, 2017 New England Journal of Medicine publication. Adding this medication was associated with higher risks of, or I mean, higher rates of response, but it does have some adverse effects, fatigue, headache, insomnia, flu-like symptoms, uh, that sort of thing. But it's kind of an add-on. Yeah. So that, that anti-thymocyte globulin that um, we mentioned earlier, so that's kind of like the backbone of therapy. And then usually, or historically, I would say they, they would add cyclosporin to that, um, as well as like a course of glucocorticoids. And um, that was kind of like the, you know, standard therapy. But when this l pag like that Cole was just talking about, was added in, um, think of that as sort of like enhancing or, or ensuring the 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 natural hematopoietic stem cell um, survival and while the immunosuppressive agents are keeping you know the autoimmune response of the body at bay, um, the almond trauma pack does improve outcomes. And there was actually a study um, from January last year called the the race trial, not to be confused with the AFib studies, um, but they were looking at uh, l trauma pack as well being added to the the standard um, therapy with um, ATG and um, cyclosporin, and um, showed that it improved the the rate, um, rapidity, and, and the strength of the hematologic response among patients who um, previously were untreated with severe aplastic anemia um, without additional toxic effects. So the add-on therapy, this is another study that proves that it is a good option to add on so that uh, they don't have to, or they can have the, the best chance of a positive outcome while being on this therapy. Um, the cost 
obviously may be prohibitive. And they've even looked at this as monotherapy, and there's some other options depending mm. on how frail the patient is. Um, you know, there's some strategies there. But uh, ideally, if the patient can tolerate it, um, they'll be on that trifecta of ATG, the cyclosporin, L-trombopag um, with a short course of steroids and things as, as well. Right. So it's a lot a lot of meds to start to take care of it, but... It is, but that's it's probably, I don't know, the tougher to treat of the ones we talked about. Yeah, I think I hematology say. is probably going to be handling that one for me for yes. you. Yes. Unless yes. you're just feeling real confident. <laughs> real confident. <laughs> um, but yeah, so... Make sure you check out that uh, this, this uh, up-to-date section on that. It does a really good job of explaining all the different um, uh, you know, monotherapies that they've studied and things like that. So, being yeah. the patient profile. But that's, uh, I think we're, uh, we get right at an hour already. We are right at it. Oh, man. That, we went through a lot of stuff. We, <laughs> There's a lot of information. We there. did. And, yes. we, and you didn't brush your kids' teeth. <laughs> I know. What am I thinking? Uh, so, um, I hope that was helpful for y'all. I hope we weren't going too fast. We were trying to fit in as much as we could in this short time. But um, it, again, like I said in the beginning, if you uh, remember the secret password, uh, which we're not going to say again because why not, um, we'll uh, make sure you go to FreeC's website as long as you're a, a, a member, unlimited member with a, a gold pro, um, membership or higher, then uh, you can get access to it no charge. Um, you put in the password, take the post-activity test, get your one-hour credit, and life is good. Thanks to uh, FreeC for continuing to partner with us all this time. I think we've, it's, we're going on like two years with them, I think. Coming up on it. crazy. It's great. Um, so they've been they've been awesome. So definitely check them out if you're not a member already. They're a uh, very very good group. And um, thanks to Pearls, uh, the uh, our, our friend uh, at the Drug Info app um, that uh, has been a good supporter of the podcast for a long time. Um, you know they uh, have been updating. Uh, I think Community Acquired Pneumonia was the newest uh, update that they had. So check that out. Always good stuff coming from them. And um, I always feel so like such a slacker when I see how fast. He, He's updating things because he's programming it all himself. I'm just mm. like, what am I doing in my life? <laughs> I'm talking on a microphone. <laughs> but uh, um, good stuff there. So check out um, www.pearls.com slash core console DRX. Um, you'll get some free charts and things, even if you don't sign up for a, a, a pro membership or whatever it's called. Um, and then if you want more traditional style, like lecture, boring content, is what I like to call it, um, check out Patreon, um, www.patreon.com slash core consult rx, and you'll get access to lectures that I do for, or similar lectures anyway that I do for my PA students, the uh, slide decks, things like that. Um, there's also a lot of pharmacotherapy practice questions for those of you who are into that kind of thing. Um, it's a good review system for a very low price of like $3 a month. So go find go find a dollar and you know, get three three friends together and you'll, you'll be good to go. That's exactly what you need to yeah, do. Yeah, just do that and then just all share my slides. <laughs> that way you can really maximize the, the dollar. But um, thank you guys so much if you have, if, for listening. If you have any questions for any of us, all, all three of our emails are in the show notes. Um, you can reach us on social media platforms. Text us on the, the number in the, uh, the show notes as well. And we'll look forward to seeing you guys in the next one. Have a good night.